Hello, this is Kyle, also known as Alientude, and today I am reviewing this Albion Next Generation Landcaster. A little bit of background here, this is not my sword. It is on loan to me from sword friend Robert, who purchased it at CombatCon from Albion for $1,085. If you're interested in buying an Albion, but the pretty extensive wait times around 18 to 20 months, kind of turns you off from doing so, going to one of the cons that Albion attends is a great way to bypass that wait. They tend to attend, I believe, two major cons in the U.S., SoCal Sword Fight in Southern California in February and Combat Con in Vegas in July. So that is, in my opinion, a great way to both try out a good number of Albion swords and then skip the wait time if you happen to find one you want to buy. Now, if you've watched very many of my reviews, chances are pretty good that you're at least somewhat familiar with Albion. I've featured a good number of their swords on the channel, and I have more videos coming relatively soon. But I wanted to go over them again and kind of give you maybe some insight that is maybe not quite as widely known about Albion. So the design philosophy of the next generation line. Well, the next generation line is designed to be historically plausible swords. They are generally not specifically based on any one extant sword from history. Although the, there are a couple that really do get close, like the Vigil is very closely based on the River Witham sword. Uh, the Alexandria is pretty close to some of the historical ones, but none of them are intended to be exact replicas. Now, the Next Generation line is 100% designed by Peter Johnson. He makes, he designs the blade blanks, he designs the overall shape, he actually hand carves the hilt furniture for molding for casting the hilt furniture. He does all that himself. And there are some people who will describe Albion swords as CNC blades. And while that is true, it's kind of misleading because it implies that they just stamp these blades out of, on a CNC mill and they're pretty much done. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. When somebody's making a sword, whether through forging, through uh, stock removal, through CNC, what, whatever, whatever method they use to get the blade to rough shape, that's what they're doing with uh, forging, with CNC. They are getting the blade to rough shape. After they do that, they then t take the sword to grinding. And that's where the majority of the nuance and the final shape of the blade comes from. And this is true historically too. Yes, they forged swords in the medieval period. They obviously didn't have CNC mills, but the forging was still done to rough shape only. And then they would be ground down a ton to get them to the final shape. So what Albion does is remove the forging process and replace it with CNC. So they no longer have a roughly shaped blade from a forge, they have a roughly shaped blade from a CNC. And then everything is done by hand. Yes, they use power tools that weren't available historically, but you know, historically they had things that weren't just manpower. You know, they had mills, they had river power, they had uh, animal powered tools. They had more than just hand grinding. The, everything was done as efficiently as possible. And that's intended to be much the case with the Albion as well. Now, when I say it's all hand ground, it is absolutely true. The fullers are all completely hand ground. The hollow grinding on some models, completely hand ground. And they don't use jigs to do, to, to aid them in their grinding. It's all 100% by hand. Now, due to that hand ground nature, that does mean that Albions do feature some flaws, imperfections, asymmetries, deviation from specifications. You know, it's unavoidable when you're talking about making something by hand. Humans aren't perfect. You know, if it's a deviation from the spec, it's usually pretty minor, but sometimes the specs on the website are just not very accurate. Albion has not been good about updating their website. I haven't seen an update to it in many years. So they may not have the most accurate specs there. Now, speaking of, you know, small imperfections, 
Peter Johnson, when he's hand carving the hilt furniture, he actually intends to create small asymmetries, small imperfections in the overall shape because it kind of gets the furniture away from the uncanny valley where things look perfect and it gives it a bit more of a human touch. So the Lancaster is representative of an Oakshot type 15 sword, which was a type of sword that saw widespread use across Europe, starting in the late 13th century, going all the way through into the early 16th, with the majority of the use throughout the 14th and 15th century. Now this is a single hand sword that is primarily focused on thrusting with this very needle-like point and overall a uh, quite stiff blade. The Lancaster in particular was designed to fit into the swords that would have been used during the War of the Roses in particular. Something that would have just, if you took this back in time, this would fit in there. Now this could have been used as the sidearm for a lot of different purposes. You know, an archer in battle, a man at arms as his sidearm, uh, even self-defense for a civilian. It's a very versatile design that is compact enough that it's just overall a, a really good, easy to carry sidearm. These types of swords have a ton of tip control, which can really help in close quarters fighting where you can maneuver the sword easily without needing to do big sweeping motions. And if you're going against somebody in armor, again, the tip control is going to be really useful as well as the thick, you know, beefy tip, because if you're going against somebody in armor, you're going to be trying to find the gaps in the armor, you know, maybe get them to raise their arms so you can get into the armpit, get knock, knock them to the ground, raise their visor, or even just stab through the eye slit. You know, this is a good weapon for trying to get into those small openings. And it's important to note that not everybody historically would have been covered head to toe in metal armor. So you don't necessarily need to be able to do that. And this sword can still deliver pretty nasty cuts. It's probably not going to be easily able to dismember a limb, but you don't need to do that to deliver a debilitating blow. And this sword, this type of sword can still deliver pretty vicious cuts. Let's take a look at the hilt, starting with the pommel. This is a wheel pommel of Oakshot Type J, and it exhibits one of the only problems with buying a sword at a con, and that is that there's a few spots of very light patina forming, a few little discolorations here and there. You know, Albion keeps these swords oiled, but a lot of people handle them, and when you're, you have a lot of handling, you know, there's only so much you can do to keep it perfectly clean. So that is something that you will time, oftentimes see at, from con bot swords. Luckily, it's very light. It'll clean up very quickly. Continuing with the visual imperfections, the grind lines on this pommel are a little rougher than I'm used to seeing from Albion. They're pretty prominent and just a little bit distracting. They could be smoothed out a little bit more, I think. And the central area in the boss, this uh, part right in here, is a little bumpy, a little sloppily shaped. It's not, a, it's again, not what you really expect from an Albion. Now that in particular would be easy to not fix, but cover up with some kind of pommel marker. And I think it would look great on this sword. Moving on from the aesthetics of it, all the little attention to detail that you expect from Albion is here. It starts a little bit thicker at the grip and tapers in thickness down towards the peen. All the edges have been smoothed over and rounded off and there's no hot spots on the pommel at all. And the peen is very evenly shaped, very clean and beefy too. Now, a good grip is one of the most important things you can have on a sword because it's where you interface with the sword. It's where your hand meets the sword and if it's not a good grip, it's not gonna be a fun sword to use. This one is a very good grip. It's wood core, leather wrap with a cord texture. There's a riser here in the center and two slightly smaller ones on either end. I'm not sure if this is Albion's dark brown or oxblood dye, 
because I could see it being either it's a little blotchy, but I actually like that blotchiness on it because one solid color ends up looking a little unnatural. The seam on the grip kind of wanders around a little bit, but I can't feel it in the hand at all. And that's good. You know, there's some grips where you will feel that seam and it can actually create a hot spot. Not the case here. It's an elliptical shape, which is wider than it is thick. And it tapers in with a little bit towards the pommel. Not a lot, but just a little bit of subtle difference there. I find it to be a very effective grip in my hands. It doesn't rotate in the hand at all. And something I would like to point out, not specific to this Lancaster, but just Albion's in general, is their transitions from the leather to the hilt furniture are just beautifully executed every time. It's completely smooth with absolutely no hot spots, very clean transitions with no glaring issues at all. It's just, it's a joy to see that attention to detail. The cross guard is what I would call a straightened oak shot type 11, and there's a lot of geometry to it. It starts out thickest here and then tapers in kind of like uh, into a cylindrical shape and then flares out a little bit right before the bulb kind of like an hourglass shape. And then obviously it has this very dramatic bulb on the end of it. The geometry here means that there's absolutely no hot spots. There really couldn't be hot spots because everything is rounded over so nicely. However, that rounding over and general geometry, I think also leads to the grind lines on here being even more visible than on the pommel. And it's a little more sloppily executed in terms of that final finish on the cross guard than I would prefer for over a thousand dollars. It's not a functional problem, but it is a, a little bit of an aesthetic. Uh, I'm not sure if I would even call it an issue, but it's something to be aware of. Now there, just like the pommel, there's also a little bit of patina in a few spots forming on this cross guard. So if you see them, they're there most likely because of the handling at the con. The gap where the cross guard meets the blade is just a little bit larger than I am used to seeing on Albion's. Not a dramatic difference, but a little bit larger. This is very much an aesthetic choice and whether or not it bothers you is pretty much personal preference. Now, what I could see, definitely see being more bothersome to people is that there's a little bit of asymmetry here. If you look right here, you can see that the blade doesn't line up perfectly with the recess in the cross guard. And I can think of three things that could be causing this. One, the blade could be a little canted to the side. The cross guard could be canted a little bit, or the edges of the recess in the cross guard could be slightly off angle. I don't know exactly which one it is. I, you know, I played around with getting, you know, putting straight edges around and doing a lot of different things. And I could never quite decide exactly what's causing it. What I can say is that it didn't affect the use of the sword at all. I don't think the blade is crooked because, you know, when I was doing cutting, when I'm moving it around, the blade, the edge alignment is good. So I don't think it's that. And while it would be nice to see it be, you know, up to Albion's typical uh, standard where it's, everything is very straight, I'm not sure this is enough of an issue to do more than minor dings of the points if I were scoring everything. <laughs> and now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. As always, here's my measurements. So the sword starts at five and a half millimeters thick, and for the first 18 or so inches, it tapers pretty evenly, about 0.4 millimeters every six inches. And then it accelerates that tapering down to a just under three millimeters, which it stays through the rest of the blade for a pretty thick tip. I wouldn't actually call the tip reinforced because it doesn't actually swell back up in thickness. It just stays robust throughout. The blade starts around 2.2 inches wide and has dramatic profile taper, ending in the very acute, very needle-like tip. The base of the blade being this wide helps give the sword a bit more cutting ability, allowing for more width at the sweet spot, a very conscious design decision by Peter Johnson. It's balanced at 3 inches from the guard and weighs in at nearly 2 pounds 11 ounces. So the sword is finished with Albion's typical satin, 
which is a very even and smooth satin that you can still make out some grind lines on. Not nearly as many as on the hilt furniture, but there are still some here. Up here near the tip, the polish gets a little bit less refined, which is probably due to the geometry here. I imagine it would be pretty hard to get a real consistent, even polish right here. And up right around here, it's pretty much unsharpened from here to, to the rest of the tip, just due to the geometry there. There's not really any way to do an edge bevel with that little width and that much thickness. The central ridge on the sword is very straight. And while I wouldn't call it soft, it's a little bit less crisp than I would expect to see from an Albion. Again, this is a very minor nitpick here. And looking down the lengths of the blade, there's absolutely no rippling at all on the blade, which is what I want to see from a sword in this price point. Now the edge beveling is kind of interesting. It's one smooth bevel to the edge, but when you look at the sword under light, the actual edge catches the light differently than the rest of the sword, which makes it look like there is a micro bevel there, but there isn't. If I run my fingers along the sword, I don't feel any change in geometry towards the edge. It's just that the very edge where it's the final sharpening was done is polished slightly different than the rest of the blade. So it catches the light differently. So let's take a look at some paper cutting here. So I'm going to start by trying to draw into the, into the paper to test if it's sharp enough to bite into the paper. So it started a little bit too blunt to do that here, but up here it did actually bite in a little bit. I'm gonna try that a little bit closer. Yeah. So it can, but not particularly well there. Let's try the other edge here. So unfortunately it's not particularly sharp on the very edges. There's a few spots where it can actually bite in a little bit, but then it starts tearing very easily. Let me try now putting the sword into the paper and then drawing through. Very smooth, which is what I expect. Yeah, that's very much what I expect out of an Albion, and it's the bare minimum in my opinion. If you insert a sword into paper and it can't even draw through at that point with the cut already started, it's just flat out not sharp. So let's take a look at some cutting footage. Now, sword friend Robert gave me permission to do water bottle cutting with this sword, as that's what he's going to do with it. But I didn't do a lot of cutting with it because frankly, it is not easy to find time to do cutting living in the desert during the summer. You know, about the only time of day that I have the ability to do cutting is about 6 a.m. Any other time of day, it's either too hot or too dark. So I have to, I, I'm limited in how much cutting I can do. One nice side effect of cutting at that time is it's a beautiful time of day. But anyways, on to the actual cutting. So I did some cutting and some thrusting, and as expected, this is not the best cutter. You know, it's a thrust-focused sword with a not particularly keen edge. But even with that, you can still get some good clean cuts. I got one cut on this double cut. My second one was perfectly smooth and silent and it shocked the hell out of me. I did not expect to get that good of a cut with this sword. I did a few false edge cuts and it moves around well. I also tried wrapping my finger around the cross guard which gives you even more tip control. And it works and the cross guard doesn't bite the hand at all. But the blade, while it's not actually sharp here, it's still thin enough that it does bite into the finger quite a bit and it did not feel pleasant. So I stopped doing that pretty quickly. Now thrusting with this sword, first off, I am terrible with accuracy on thrusting. Even with a sword with this much tip control, I am just not good at getting it where I want it to go. So, you know, keep that in mind when you're seeing this thrusting. On these two little dairy containers, these, these are actually pretty thick, tough plastic. And I was able to get one all the way through and it might have actually got into the second one, but if so, it was just barely. But overall, a lot of fun to thrust with the sword, even with my terrible accuracy, and more fun to cut with it than I expected. So this sword is kind of an interesting one to handle. It weighs two pounds, 10 ounces, 
which is pretty normal for an arming sword, but it's balanced pretty close to the hilt. Looks like that's right around three inches if I'm remembering right. And that's to be expected on a thrust focus sword. When you're focusing on thrusting, you wanna have a lot of tip control. You wanna be able to keep the tip exactly where you want it to go so that you can get into the gaps in armor. So generally speaking, thrust focus swords will be balanced closer to the hilt, which sacrifices some cutting power. There's not as much blade presence out there, but it again, gives you more tip control. And this sword definitely has that. You know, it doesn't, at two pounds, 10 ounces, it doesn't feel blade heavy at all. The hilt noticeably does feel a little bit heavier than sometimes you'll get on more nimble sword, or you'll get on swords that are more cut focused because there you want some blade presence to help you accelerate the blade and really go through the full cut. Whereas this one, you know, you can definitely still cut with it, but it definitely has more of a tip presence feel than cut focus feel. And this is a very stiff blade there. If you look at the vibrations, there's very, there's not very much vibration there at all, but it's the center of percussions right around there. I believe it was at 19 inches when I measured it. And you can see there, it's a pretty narrow blade there. It's not particularly wide, which means it's going to be less effective of a cutter. What I found when using this is if I target my cutting back a little bit further, cl closer to the hilt from that percussion node, it starts getting to be a bit easier to cut, which is again, pretty much what you'd expect because the blade starts getting a little bit wider there. Therefore, the edge angle is a little bit, gen is a little bit more conducive to cutting. When I'm moving the sword around, the grip feels great. I can hold it tightly here and I can't really rotate it. If I'm really cranking on the cross guard, I can rotate it a little bit, but it locks my hand in well. The center riser right here, I can feel that. And that does help me, my, it kind of rests right between my two fingers here and helps me lock it in. When I finger the guard, finger the blade, wrap my finger around the cross guard like that, it's even, it's even better. However, when I did this, when I was cutting, while this part of the blade is not sharp, if you, I'll see if I can get a close up of it, you can see it's fully on, full on not sharpened there. It's still a fine enough edge that when it, I impact the sword, when I'm cutting, it digs into the hand quite a bit and it or digs into the finger quite a bit. It didn't feel particularly good when I was doing that. If I was using like leather gloves or something like that, wouldn't be a problem at all, I don't think. So when I move the sword out here, because it's a very stiff blade, it doesn't wobble at all. And I can, you know, just kind of continue the motion and just move it around very well. It feels really good to move around. You know, if I'm just trying to keep it in one place and it just, it moves very well. I can target where I want the point to go very easily, which again is what you expect from a thrust focused sword. So I'm going to compare the Lancaster here to two other swords, one of them being the Albion Sovereign. This would be a little bit earlier medieval period, not a lot, but a little bit earlier than the Lancaster. And this one weighs a little bit under three pounds. I don't remember the exact amount. I think it's around two pounds, 14, 15 ounces, somewhere like that. And Talk about very different swords here. The Sovereign here is much, much wider throughout almost the entire blade. It's considerably shorter. The hilts are actually relatively similar though. I'm gonna put the Lancaster down here for a moment. So the Sovereign, it has more blade presence. There's no doubt about that. Out here, the blade is considerably wider and that gives it more cutting power but with such a short blade, it's, this is such an interesting handling sword to me because it's, it's short. It's like around 28, 29 inches from what I remember. Don't quote me on that. But it feels powerful. It feels hefty without feeling bad. It's very nimble. 
it's balanced. It's actually balanced pretty close to what the Lancaster is. So that helps it feel nimble because like I said, three inches or so, that's a good place for very nimble feeling swords. But this one definitely feels more tip heavy, not tip heavy, but tip forward. It feels more like a cutting sword. And it is about the same stiffness, I would say, because it's a shorter blade, it's going to maintain stiffness easier than a longer blade. But these actually feel considerably similar, except that this one feels a little bit more blade heavy, like I said, a little bit more focused on cutting, a little bit less tip control, but not a lot. And overall, it's actually pretty surprising just how similar they feel. When I pick up the Lancaster, okay, so the, I'm, when I pick it up again, the Lancaster, I immediately do feel those several, several ounces different difference. These, this one definitely feels a lighter on the arm, easier to redirect and just move around. So the Lancaster definitely feels a little bit lighter, a little bit more nimble, definitely more tip control, but the Sovereign still feels great. The other sword I'm going to compare the, to the Lancaster is the Albion Kingmaker. Now this is pretty much a contemporary of the Lancaster in the medieval period. The Type 15 swords were generally in use from, I believe, the 14th into the early 16th century, mostly in the 14th and 15th. And I believe uh, the Kingmaker, which is Type 18, would have been more in the 14th and 15th and probably into the 16th as well. I think this one predates the Kingmaker style, the 18, a little bit, but it's they are pretty much contemporaries medieval. And if you look at them, they actually have a pretty similar profile with the Lancaster definitely getting more narrow, but it starts a little bit wider as well. The hilts are relatively similar in overall size. The Kingmaker might have a slightly longer grip. And the blade lengths, pretty similar. It looks like the Kingmaker might be about an inch longer. So let me take a look at, put down the Lancaster and take a look at the Kingmaker. So the Kingmaker is going to be a cut and thrust focused sword. And one of the first things I noticed when I picked this sword up is that the hilt feels not heavy, but it feels substantial. You know, there's not like this, it doesn't feel like it's a point heavy because the hilt has quite a bit of meat to it. The pommel definitely feels uh, solid to me. It may not be, I don't know for sure, but it feel, the entire hilt feels substantial. But what's interesting is the blade is balanced a little bit further out than the Latin caster. That looks to me like about four inches right around there. And it does have more tip or more blade presence, definitely, which makes sense because it, it does stay broader longer than the Lancaster does. And the hollow grind geometry on here means it's pretty much just as stiff as the Lancaster. In fact, it might, if you look, just looking at those, uh, the vibration there, it looks like it actually might be a little bit stiffer than the Lancaster. I'm just moving the point around. It does feel like I have a little bit less tip control with the Kingmaker. Not a lot, but a little bit less. Definitely, if I'm moving it out there, definitely feels like I have more blade presence here, more, t more, uh, more authority in the cut. I can redirect motion very easily here. And overall, there, these three swords that I'm comparing to the Lancaster, they really don't feel a ton different, which is really interesting because they are three very different swords, especially the Sovereign is a very different. All right, so I picked this one back up. This one, as soon as I pick it up, I can feel the weight feels a little bit further back. Makes sense because the point of balance on the Kingmaker is further out. And overall, this feels a little bit lighter. I don't have the stats for the Kingmaker off the top of my head, but I think it is a little bit heavier. Not a lot, but a little bit. And yeah, this one definitely feels more agile, more nimble, more tip control. So three very different Albion swords, all of them feeling relatively similar, but with very minor differences. This is something that is can be really hard to explain on camera how they feel 
when they're when the differences are small, it can be really hard to explain the the it in detail because you're trying to translate very minor feel differences to words and at least my words I feel like I'm failing here. It's why going to something like Combat Con or SoCal Sword Fight where Albion has a good number of swords there that you can pick up, move around and feel, why I think it can be so valuable because you get more experience handling more swords and you can get an idea of how they handle compared to each other. Now, potential improvements. I've said before that I don't typically do this section for Albion swords because it's rarely needed. However, there's enough minor fit and finish issues on this sword that I think they bear pointing out one last time. The polish on the pommel and cross guard could really be cleaned up a bit more. The fit of the cross guard to the blade, what, whatever's causing that ever so slight asymmetry could be cleaned up and just seated in there a little bit better. Very minor little things here. They don't affect the functionality of the sword at all. However, I know Albion's capable of putting out higher quality fit and finish than this because I have a good number of Albions myself. I have experience with more. And this one probably has some of the, I won't say worst because that implies it's bad. It has the least refined finish of probably the Albions I've reviewed. Now, my one last thing, I've said this before, I'll say it uh, just minorly, I wish Albion would put a keener edge on their swords. I like to use my swords and I don't think they put enough of a, a keen enough edge to really make them good user, uh, effective user use swords in the backyard for cutting, for whether that be water bottles, tatami, pool noodles, whatever you want to talk about. A keen edge is important for that. And Albion tends to not put quite enough of, a, quite not quite sharp enough of an edge for it to be, for their swords to really be effective at backyard cutting. So bottom line, this sword costs $1,085 brand new from Albion. What do you get for that price and is it worth it? Well, what you get is a sword of a type that was ubiquitous throughout medieval history for our multiple centuries. You get a sword that was designed by Peter Johnson, one of the premier medieval sword researchers in the world. You get one that it handles very, very well, that is focused heavily on thrusting while still retaining some ability to cut. While this one does have a few very minor fit and finish issues, I have seen enough Albions that I can say that's not common. So it's very likely if you were to buy a new one, you would get a sword that had better fit and finish than this one. And that's not to say that this is bad, just slightly worse than Albion's typical. And finally, you get a sword with excellent edge beveling, but not particularly great final sharpening. But due to that excellent edge beveling, it would not take very much effort to get the sword up to very keen and quite sharp. So is it worth $1,085? Well, it's important to say this is not the type of sword I gravitate to. Aside from the fact that long swords are my favorite, in terms of arming swords, I tend to like ones that are a little bit more balanced between cut and thrust. I do tend to like agile swords, and I think this one has a good amount of agility while still maintaining enough blade presence to be decent as a cutter. But it's just not quite in my wheelhouse. That's not to say it's a bad sword. It's not. It's an excellent sword, and it's just not quite what I would want to spend my money on. I do think that it is worth it if this is the type of sword you're going for. Maybe you want a thrust-focused arming sword. Maybe you want something that specifically would fit right into the uh, War of the Roses time period. I can't answer that for you, obviously, but for me, I don't think I would spend my $1,085 on this sword. However, I do think it is worth that price if this is the type of sword you want to get. Even with the very minor fit and finish flaws that are that I've pointed out here, I think this sword is very much worth it. And honestly, it's not much of a surprise. I have six Albions myself and two others that were customized. So it should be no surprise that I find them to be worth it. It's just that this specific one, the Lancaster, is not a sword that I want to own. 
And let's bring this review to a close. Thank you for watching. Thank you to sword friend Robert for loaning me the sword. And a special thank you to Peter Johnson for graciously offering your time and letting me chat with you about the sword and Albion in general. For everybody else, if you like the video, please hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, all the things that YouTube wants to see to know that you like the video, you want to see more, and to have it recommend the channel to continue to grow. Until next time, Alien Toot out.